I'll be okay. Please go ahead. All right. Hi so, everyone. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, our project is on determining truth in the digital age, and uh, my name is Jason. Hi everyone. I'm Amon. Hi everybody. My Hi. name is Ronan. Hi, I'm Kayla. I'm a, I unfortunately can't be on camera at the moment, but hopefully you guys can hear me. Yes, we can hear you, no problem. I was really excited to talk to you about what we will be discussing today because it's a very, very relevant topic. So let's talk a bit about why is this something that's important? Okay, so right now there's an epidemic of fake news and disinformation threatening our society. And this information is just false information that is spread deliberately to deceive people. And right now it's infecting the public consciousness through social media apps such as Facebook and Twitter. In fact, NPR actually found that 65% of fake news related to the COVID-19 pandemic originated from 12 individuals. So as this volume of disinformation increases, verifiable information gets lost. And as a result, we see an, we see an increase in confusion over what's real and what isn't. So <clears throat> the takeaway from what Roman, Ronan said is that we are currently facing issues with ill-intended parties exploiting the informational environment of social media platforms. These malicious users intend to spread false information in an effort to advance their agendas. And unless we take action, these parties will continue sowing discord. To combat this, we can immediately think to do one of two things. We can cleanse social media platforms from all inaccurate information, but this would be nearly impossible. This approach can also lead to questions of censorship, which we want to avoid with our final solution. So automatically method one is ruled out. Now for a different approach. Instead of wiping down social media platforms, we should focus on lessening the vulnerability social media platforms have to this exploitation. What this entails is bolstering the circulation algorithms of social media apps. In doing so, we can reduce the spread of disinformation across social media and likewise reduce its impact on society. We will now propose an, an innovative framework that is grounded around this idea. So let's talk about this framework because it's really the centerpiece of our project. Our idea is that what we would really like is sort of a multi-level data filtering system. And as my esteemed colleagues said before me, we don't want to be dealing with content moderation because, because we don't want to be dealing with the cat and mouse game of like uh, of the actual social media platform moderators deleting a post and then malicious actors learning from that and then learning what doesn't trigger those flags. So we feel that focusing on content moderation kind of gets around this issue. So our multi-level data filtering system has two main components to it. The first is that it detects whether a post is fraudulent or put out by bots, which are fake posts or computer generated posts based on what we call bot activity. Now, what that means is if you have a post that receives a lot of likes and a lot of comments from strange IP addresses, within a short period of the post being created. And that's probably some sort of targeted activity. Our research has shown that posts that receive so much engagement from the same area soon after that creation are posts that are fraudulent because truly viral posts, where posts go viral naturally, have a much different pattern of how they gain their votes. It's more of an exponential curve. Now let's talk a bit about why we're targeting, targeting circulation. A natural question that might pop up is, well, you're still leaving that information out there. Isn't that dangerous? Because it can still affect people. What if you act too late and some people still see it? Well, our idea is that we want our system to be built on the notion of robustness. We want it to be able to deal with a wide variety of cases, and we don't want it to be rendered obsolete every few, few years and constantly have to be updated. That's what would happen if you focus on a content moderation system. 
a website that I like I am familiar with, Quora, ran into this issue. And what they had every time we set up new moderators with new flags triggered to delete posts, people just found ways around that by posting images or links or just coding their messages differently. And you and that just leads to an issue because you're spending a lot of resources with not much gain. Furthermore, circulation can also be paired with content. It doesn't have to be an either or system. Our framework is just simply limited to talking about circulation. Let's talk a bit about the major innovation of our product, which is a flag, a suspicious flag. So if a post is dangerous, we'll mark it as suspicious. And if it's not dangerous, we'll mark it as not suspicious. And we have two ways of actually setting this flag. The first way is, as we mentioned before, if there's a lot of suspicious bot activity, and the way we can accomplish setting this up is through a machine learning algorithm. We can think about a supervised learning algorithm, just roughly speaking, for which our two labels would be suspicious and not suspicious. And we could train the actual, we could train the actual system using posts that we know have been generated by bots or malicious actors. And that's how it'll be able to learn over time. Because there's no shortage of horrible posts out there, as two seconds in Twitter would tell you. The second aspect of how the suspicious flag would be generated is through parsing, actually, something that every software more CS student is, is familiar with. We're going to be looking at posts and we're going to be comparing the information within those posts with a database that we have relevant to that particular topic. So, for example, we won't be maintaining one database which shows pandemic, COVID pandemic disinformation, along with disinformation about the Russia Ukraine crisis. We want to keep them separate so there's no chance of them interweaving and contradicting each other. So for example, on the nature of the pandemic, if someone makes a post, within a couple of seconds of the post being created, we run some parsing and pattern matching using regexes to compare it to the information within the database. And if they directly contradict one another, we mark the post with a suspicious flag. Now, what does this flag do? It does a couple of things. If on platforms like Facebook, where there's an actual search engine, we will de-index that post, which means it's not searchable. Uh, this would prevent people from being able to find it, being able to look it up, and thus completely cut off its circulation. However, in the event that we make a mistake, which you know it happens because algorithms are also limited and it's entirely possible we make a mistake, we it's very, very easy to, re to re-index that post again. The amount of harm done is mitigated. This allows suspicious posts to not be recommended and circulated, thus really restricting their impact. Now, Jason has a few notes on actually talking about truth and popularity and how they intersect with our framework. Yeah, thanks, Mon. So in addition to our database solution, we need to discuss the relationship between the post distance from the truth and its popularity with the probability of its circulation. The measure of a post variance from the truth can be calculated from the suspicious, suspicious flag, as Amon mentioned, in the database and other advanced existing machine learning capabilities. For example, in the case where the post contains truthful information as it matches to our database sources, our social algorithm will circle this post based on its popularity solely. In the case where the post contains a sizable amount of disinformation from the truth and is extremely popular, the social algorithm will heavily suppress the circulation of this post to effectively reduce the spread of disinformation on social media platforms. However, posts that are distinct from the truth but are unpopular will not be as heavily suppressed as the prior example. Nevertheless, its probability of circulation will still be below average. So let's talk about ethics because we are in an ethics in an age of tech class. It feels like we should probably be talking about that somewhere. And there's two things we should really talk about. I want to convince you, the audience, of two things. The first is that this problem that we're dealing with is in of itself unethical. And the second is that our solution is ethical. So let's start by talking about the problem. And there's two perspectives you can approach this, and I'll lay them both at you and allow you to make a decision on which one you find more compelling. The first is from a Kantian perspective or deontological perspective. This is with something with special reference to what we call the formula of the end in itself. What that means, like the pure statement of that is that we should be treating people not as mere means, but as ends in of themselves. What this means 
is that we should be treating people as if their happiness were the ultimate end goal. And it's only okay to use people as means if they're fully aware of the circumstances and, and the conditions in which you're using them. For example, if you go to get a haircut, you're using that barber as a means. But since both you and him are aware of the full transaction and he's being well compensated and it's something that he agreed into with full knowledge, there's nothing unethical about it. On the other hand, with fake news, when malicious actors spread disinformation, they do so knowingly limiting their audiences, like their audiences access to information, like true facts, and allowing them to make a conclusion on their own about what they believe. To bring up a basic example, Alex Jones, who never truly revealed the efficacy of the COVID vaccines in his posts. So his audience is not actually getting the full picture of all the facts they need to make a decision of, on what he says. This is why he's basically using his audience and he and every other malicious act to express this information, they use their audience as mere means to some goal, either profit or sowing discord, and therefore not giving them the full information they need to make a decision. This is why this is unethical from a Kantian perspective. Now let's talk about utilitarian perspectives, because that's also very interesting and especially relevant when we talk about our solution and why that's ethical. A utilitarian perspective is predicated on what we call the greatest happiness principle, or at the very least, John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism is. The idea is that you want to, very broadly speaking, maximize happiness and minimize harm. Fake news sows discord in populations and sets them at each other's throats. We can only look at the result of the 2016 election or what's happening in the pandemic today with people protesting and castigating lawyers and nurses for spreading what they call a hoax. So you're creating really polarized environments where people are at each other's throats and people have also died or been severely affected by this. Through, by any perspective, you, from a utilitarian perspective, fake news is sowing discord and therefore minimizing happiness and maximizing harm. So this is exactly why, from two perspectives, these problems are, this problem is unethical. Now, we've talked about our problem, but what about our solution? Is that ethical? ethical? Well, there's a trivial and really, really easy answer here, which is if your solution solves an unethical problem, that makes it ethical, which is funny to think about, but it's also a bit unsatisfying. So let's also explore this from a utilitarian perspective. As we said before, Utilitarianism is the greatest good for the greatest number, where we define good as maximizing happiness and minimizing pain. Our framework restricts the circulation of malicious posts, which means less people will see them, which means less people will be influenced by them. So we're, this way, we're minimizing pain and therefore happiness is maximized because discord is minimized. This makes it ethical. Another perspective we want to talk about here, also from utilitarianism, is how does it contrast with other solutions for the topic? How does our framework compare with the existing content moderation algorithms that are today from an ethical perspective? So for example, Facebook and Twitter work based on what we call content moderation, which is if a post is offending, they delete it. Here's the issue. If they get things wrong, they delete a valid post, it leads to more frustration and more of an outcry because deleting a post has much greater impact than just simply lo limiting its circulation. Our system, in the worst case, if it limits the circulation of a post that is that was by mistake, the amount of harm done is less compared to what is done by the existing content moderation algorithms. So not only is our framework ethical, it's also more ethical than the competition. And we want to talk a bit about the feedback that we've received and how we've evolved based on that. And we have Jason here for that. Yeah, so at first, our original solution was for companies to circulate the content of posts and compare them against company set tags used to identify disinformation such as hoax with anti-vax efforts. Companies would take down any post that match these tags and would make constant daily adjustments and modifications to their tags to target disinformation from the new strategies of those that spread fake news. From our feedback, we have changed our innovative solution to a social algorithm with a multi-level database filtering process focused on information circulation 
with the main reasoning from the idea that fake news cannot be identified without evidence. One of our changes was that users that want to spread fake news will adjust the wording in their post to bypass the chosen keywords of our tags, therefore relying on a company to manually adjust its tags constantly to account for the changes by these malicious users. Is it effective due to the fact that it is an endless chase of trying to cover the holes that these users have cunningly found? By having posts validated by our database, there's no way for these malicious users to bypass these restrictions based because their posts must directly match the sources within our database. Arguably, the most important piece of feedback was for us to focus on either content circulation or purely content moderation. And we chose to focus on content circulation because it is more effective, especially with the use of a database solution. So to summarize, the current informational environment on social media platforms is especially susceptible to malicious parties seeking to sow discourse. We also recognize how hazardous this, this rapid spread of disinformation is for the general population. So to combat these issues, we have proposed an innovative circulation-based solution grounded around lessening the rapid spread and overall impact of disinformation on social media. In general, our framework will will flag posts for suspicious engagement and surveil the suspiciousness, the suspiciousness of flag posts through a multi-level validity checking system. If our framework then determines that a flagged post does contain false information, then its circulation will be restricted. So two, favor two favorable qualities with this framework is that the cat and mouse chase between social media algorithms and those that spread dis disinformation is avoided. Likewise, our solution also avoids any possible censorship issues. On the other hand, one issue that our solution can further be improved upon is its ability to parse the content of videos and photos. To end with this topic of ethics, since our framework will, since our framework will work towards minimizing the circulation and impact of fake news on social media, it is ethical under the principle of utilitarianism. The reason for this is because our goals for developing a framework ensures that its impact will benefit most people, which is a key principle under Mill's definition of utilitarianism. So before ending our presentation, Ronan will now talk about what we have learned from our project and any future work. Thanks, Kayla. So in regards to what we've learned throughout the project, we've discovered just how prevalent fake news is in online discourse. We also have a better understanding of the correlation between popularity, engagement, and virality of both posts and posters. In addition to this, we have come to see the importance of developing a solution to fake news based on circulation instead of just content moderation, which was the basis of our original framework. If we had more time on this project, then we would determine the correct architecture for the neural network that handles bot activity and address scenarios where users might try to work around these filters like posting links to external websites as opposed to placing the disinformation in the post itself. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, very good. And uh, I, I will start to ask you uh, uh, a few questions. Uh, um, in fact, in your case, it's probably some of the comments so for discussion, okay, some of the uh, suggestion I have. Okay, uh, number one, uh, you actually mentioned something which I think is, is very important, uh, very interesting. Um, I think you said something like, uh, um, any solution or something, I forgot exactly the wording, that any solution that solve an ethical problem is going to be ethical. So, so a solution to an ethical problem is going to be ethical. Um, how do you know that uh, um, the, the solution actually solved an ethical problem? I mean, how do you know that maybe a solution to an ethical problem actually introduce other possibility for unethical, um, uh, how do I say that? Um, a new vulnerability that's actually introduced new type of unethical situation. What's your thought on that? 
I think that's a really interesting question, Professor. And I think there's like a couple of ways you can look at it. The first is that we make sure to make note of the fact that saying that uh, if something solves an unethical problem, it's ethical. We mentioned in our slides as well that it's it's a very trivial conclusion and not a very satisfying conclusion for exactly the reason that you said. It's wrong and it's a really, really broad statement. But if we had to, uh, right over here, but if we had to talk about it from the perspective of, well, doesn't it, isn't there more potential of introducing other ethical issues? Absolutely. Just to talk about our topic in particular, the issue coming up with a framework to deal with fake news is number one. But it le there's a couple of issues that come up. The first is when you're talking about things like politics, what's the line between fake news and legitimate political satire? That's a really, really blurry line. And if you fall on the wrong side of that line, what you're doing could be basically described as censorship, which is really, really dangerous and really bad for a good society. And this is what makes the problem we're dealing with so tricky. We can also look at it from a utilitarian perspective, which is, uh, is our pro is, uh, is what is the situation after we introduce our framework more ethical compared to the status quo, which I think is a bit more of an interesting question. Our confidence in our algorithm comes from the fact that a lot of what we've discovered in our research about fake news and spread is not based on like the actual truth value of individual posts. Like someone could post some complete garbage out there and it's not so much what's in that post as compared to how much it's spread, that's the issue. So we feel reasonably confident when we say that limiting circulation would limit its impact. So in that case, while there is definitely a potential for more unethical situations to come up, by limiting the spread of fake news, our situation is going to be more ethical than just allowing fake news to run willy-nilly and free. This is not to say that the ethical issues that could come about as a result of our framework are insignificant. They're not, and they need to be addressed, and they're, they're important questions. But it's to say that it's at least better than what the situation would have been otherwise. I'm sorry, I hope I answered that question. Sure, sure. I mean, it's it's a it's an interesting statement when we decide what is ethical, as you said, it's actually have a lot of, um, I would say, uh, uh, a lot of things we need to consider. So, so let me actually just follow up my, my own question. Now I ask the next question. Um, in your solution, you propose to suppress something is suspicious, especially those are being uh, um, uh, promoted by bots. Assuming you have a way to, to identify which one are bots, and you also mentioned you are not doing a lot of content moderation. It's unclear to me how you actually be able to determine the content, but let me get to my point. Um, um, okay, the assumption I have is the bots is going to be more and more like a, like a real user. So the, 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 the people who actually develop the bots and then to sell those accounts as a bot, as a service, um, they, they intentionally try to avoid being detected as bots. So it will not be eliminated. So, so this is itself, bot itself is a cat and mouse game, okay? So now my question to you is that under your framework, if there is a piece of news or information, it's truthful, it's truthful but the bots is actually promoting it or whatever bots that under your algorithm, you classify those are bots. They're actually promoting that content, but the content itself is truthful. Would you suppress that particular uh, content or its propagation? I think so. Um, I think my teammates might have their own opinions in this. My opinion on it is that this leads to the greater question of um, uh, are, should bots even be on social media platforms, which is a very relevant question because, the, for example, Elon Musk is in the news recently. He, he halted his Twitter bid because he wanted more of an assurance on the fact that Twitter would, take, would deal with bots better, that they would implement stricter policies to take care and delete bots from the platform. So it's a very relevant question. And I just want to make that note. But the question is, 
like we are on the side that we don't think bots are good for social media platforms as a whole. We think that they're dangerous, that they create echo chambers, and that their presence, no matter what they're doing, isn't good. There's no significant benefit from having the bot even upload like truthful information. If the same bots could be repurposed for uploading non-truthful information or posting scam links or the likes. So our idea is that it yes, it is a blunt tool and it gets rid of bots not just based on what they're doing, but rather on what they are. But we're okay with that trade-off because we don't think bots are necessarily good for a platform at all. Okay. Let me just follow up that question a little bit to clarify my own question. So assuming based on your algorithm, you realize that 50% of the accounts that are uh, promoting this particular news is actually bot, which means that the other 50% are real accounts. Are, we, 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 we cannot classify as, as a bot. So assuming this 100% are actually promoting a particular news. So how are you going to do with that news? Are you going to suppress very hard in its, pop, in its propagation? Or you're going to uh, just take the, just remove the, the um, the contribution of that fifty percent bots, but still consider that fifty percent um, um, the real you you consider the real user and their contribution to the popularity to the circulation. So so my my question is: Are you going to extra suppress? Let me actually just just tell you that what's the pro and cons about it's a, it's a very very uh, interesting challenge because. If that news is is actually false, because because if it's false, the bot already influenced the real user, and the real users start to populate, uh, try to try to uh, uh, make it popular, try to circle it around, and so in that case, you want to suppress it. But on the other hand, if the bots, the goal of the bots is try to suppress the propagation of true news say this news is so important for our society to actually be able to um, 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 respond to, to COVID or whatever. And, and the bot is, is actually has propaganda based on your algorithm. They're actually trying to make it looks like it's bot promoting it and such that you suppress. So you're actually potentially suppressing the, pop, the propagation of a, some true news and it's actually going to be really valuable. So, so, th so there's a two sides of the coin and, and that's why you said when you actually come up with a solution to an ethical problem, an ethical problem, and that solution might be used by the bot to actually achieve another unethical goal. So, right, so what, 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 what do you think about that? Um, if any of my teammates want to say something, uh, yeah. they can go ahead. <clears throat> Otherwise, I can follow up later. I think I can go. Um, like, I think that's what makes our solution so innovative and I think I discussed it a little bit on the uh, slide about the cases where basically I don't think it would hurt too much if um, the truth keeps getting um, circulated because at the end of the day if obviously if it's false then we're, we're going to suppress it but if the truth is still getting circulated um, I think we just keep it based on its popularity and uh, obviously we're going to look more into it really to bots but for the most part I think that having the truth um, be circulated even by, by bot popularity is fine as long as the information actually matches our database and is actually true, um, actually legitimately true, then I think it's fine. Right. So, so, so that's good. But then I, I'm sorry because this is my area. So usually I'm hitting it extremely hard on this. So it's a true news. It's actually being popular. And we, if we let the bot and let the circulation allow this, this news to be propagated, but that might be the other strategy of the attacker. The other strategy of the attacker is that you should actually, we as a society should focus on certain truths. Certain truths, say we should focus on today, should be focused on Texas shooting. And, and the thing is, I want to divert the society's attention to that particular issue. So what I did is I make circulation, I essentially manipulate the circulation 
in a way such that now you circulate a lot of news about COVID, but the real attention should be Texas shooting. You understand what I'm saying? So sometimes it's yeah. true, we know, whether it's a bot, we might be able to know, but then what's the need of our society at the moment to address? Who actually decide that? Um, I'm sorry. It, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I was just saying that as I understand, I sort of get what you're saying, Professor, which is that it's not some, like the situation, this, like we don't just have to deal with the idea of how do we target fake news? Because that's not the only way that an agenda can be spun. It's also about what truths are focused on. Right. And you mentioned that our algorithm creates a situation where it's possible for some bots to take advantage of that by basically upvoting and engaging with posts that they want to be suppressed once they figure out the way our algorithm works. And that way, it's not so much that it's not like the issue here isn't the spread of fake news anymore. It's the spread of only certain truths without any other truths to counterbalance it. And like you gave the example, what if you want people to only focus on, for example, gun issues instead of the pandemic issues? So you suppress pandemic news and only spread gun news, which is a different question to answer. I think that's a difficult question. And it's something we were also thinking about in our report, which we, and one of the things we mentioned at the end of our report was that an idea we were encouraging was a switch from a, a from a suspicious flag to a suspicious gradient, which would alleviate some of these issues. The idea is that instead of it being a binary one or zero, this is suspicious, this is not suspicious. We have a suspicious gradient where a sliding scale from not suspicious at all to, and eh, this is really, really dangerous. And posts could be like shifted up and down on that based on, like, bot, based on bot activity. And this would still give people, and since this is a multi-level system, what we would do is we'd have a suspicious gradient and on top of that we'd have our database which does a pattern matching and like regex checking to check the validity of the validity of that news so in this case number one if you have a situation where the news is false uh the database will catch that even if there isn't a lot of bot activity and the post will be suppressed anyway but if let's say the news is true and there's a decent amount of bot activity but not a lot of bot activity and we don't suppress the post completely. Instead, we have a gradient where it's re may, it might be recommended less than usual, but it doesn't mean it's not recommended at all. So we still give it a chance to become viral naturally. And I think this is, it's a difficult question that you asked, but this is sort of our idea of trying to thread the needle. Right. No, I understand. That's why I said, I expect that you don't have a, a, a clear answer. I mean, nobody has a clear answer to this question because this is so important. Uh, so difficult that uh, uh, the um, the problem of fake news has multiple fronts. That if we're going to come up with a, a good circulation algorithm, then uh, we we need to try to think about a more comprehensive one to address all the cases. So that lead me to two more questions. I'm sorry, I probably asked your team more questions than I normally would because I'm really interested in this topic. Um, can, uh, can one of you write down the question in, your, in, your, um, in one of the slides and then show it? Um, the, the first one is what, uh, what do we like to read? And the second sentence, what should we read? There's two questions, what, what should we read or what do we like to read? Okay, the reason I asked those two questions is that um, based on our discussion, we think it's an ethical decision to let the real user, okay, the real user, um, not bot user, to drive the circulation of the social algorithm. So essentially what we're saying is that the machine learning is learning what the real user like to read because that's social algorithm, right? Social algorithm is determined that this is what you like and we try to uh, try to propagate. I mean, if, if everybody likes to read anything about uh, Texas or reading from pandemic or reading from the celebrity news, that's the first question. What do we like to read? And that's actually what social algorithm circulation 
has been focused. If you eliminate the bots, assuming those are all true user. But in our society, there is another thing which social algorithm could be doing, but nobody has done this, is what, what I call a, a more of a what should we read? Because we're, we're ignorant and we are not sensitive to certain issue, corruption in say Nigeria, or, or a lot of this ethical issue in the whole world. And, and the thing is that we never get explored to those issues which social algorithm potentially can help in circulation. And the second question become really hard for the design, which I don't think any of the uh, commercial uh, company uh, really do this. We have to rely on activists. Activists, they kind of push it. And you can actually see that uh, Alex Jones may be an activist <laughs> to what he believe and which, which but in a bad way, of course. But, um, but the thing is that he is an activist, actually, if you think about that. So, so those people are trying to drive to push to our society. So that, that is actually some question. Um, I, I really think this is going to be uh, a huge, if somehow we can address uh, not only the first one, but the second one as well. What should we read? Okay. So that, now that actually lead to my last question that I would like to ask you, which is related to what should we read? So um, in your algorithm, the, the, you're using the idea of suppression of a circulation. So essentially what we want is that all the information, the good information get propagated to the people if we can determine good. But we also try to um, um, reduce the chance for the bad information influence us as, as soon as we can, assuming we can real time take care of that. Okay, here, here is what, what I, I want to offer is that assuming Alex Jones uh, is propagating whatever his news and assuming initially we didn't know that it, it was Alex Jones. We didn't know. And, and we already been uh, influenced by the news. I'm sorry to pick him as an example, but this could happen to everyone, okay? A lot of us. Um, so the thing is that what I really want to do is that the social algorithm should know what I have received. Means that what I have read, and the thing is that if I identify, you said there are 12 individuals that's influenced 65% of the, of the fake news, uh, of the fake news about uh, um, vaccine or COVID, right? That's, that's your number. So the social algorithm might actually look at the, uh, my profile and identify this 12 individual, what kind of news extended a network of news or information that's actually related to uh, this particular NPR study. And, and the thing is that now he actually tried to contrast to say what kind of person I will be on this position with all this news I have received or without those news I have received. So assuming that there are 40% of the information I receive is being influenced by say this 12 individual, but the other 60 is actually not. Okay, so I can actually do a contrast about what is the key concept that's being influenced or that has not been delivered to me. Removing this 40% and with this 40%. So I can actually contrast about for each individual one of us. And now the concept is interesting is that I can actually now determine what should we read based on the difference. Okay, the, the, the thing is that so far, all the social algorithm, circulation algorithm has been focused on, okay, how do I actually suppress that? How do I suppress? How do I determine what's popular, what's not popular? But to be honest with you, it's only after I read your paper, I start to realize 
we should actually also focus on the, the recovery. Recovery means that you have been influenced. I mean, in fact, a lot of things we don't actually know they are bad or they are biased until for a period of time. And our society already got torn apart. And, and so in that case, if you are a, a, a extreme person, means that I'm far left or far right, it's probably not going to help me because I already stuck my mind. I, I don't want to actually hear what the other, other has to say because I don't want to be open to experience. I want to stick to my own echo chamber. But for other people, when, when you actually, um, this is Kantian. Kantian need to find more information to be able to make a decision. Then I actually want to use this tool to say, hey, what have I missing? What have, my, what have I uh, been influenced incorrectly by the circulation? And, and then that actually bring that attention on certain topic about what did I miss? And I think that will be addressing some of the what should we read issue to be able to catch up. And that, that's actually something which I think your, your work could, be, could have a lot of potential if you also develop in that perspective. And that's actually very, that's actually not so, that's actually not going to be uh, supervised machine learning because supervised machine learning means you have a, a example, you have the training example to do that. But this is going to be, I, I will call them maybe unsupervised machine learning because you are contrasting, comparing two view. I'm not saying which view is right, which view is wrong but you have a one view, which is influenced by that 12 individual of 65%, or the other view is actually not influenced by that uh, 12 individual. And what will be the difference? Maybe come up with some interesting information that we should receive to do that, yeah. Okay, it's just a comment, not a question, but, but I think what, whatever you're doing uh, has a, um, not only important to our society, but it has a, a lot of depths into that um, um, is we can use machine learning as a tool, but we also um, have to think about what is the fundamental of this issue. The fundamental of the whole issue is that the, uh, by the way, I should, I should actually mention that um, I was focused on circulation for a long period of time, try to avoid doing content. At some point I realized that will not work well. I need to actually address both content and, uh, and the circulation. So that's why uh, it motivates a lot of questions I'm asking. Um, the, the determination is what's the purpose of social algorithm or circulation? Is this just try to fulfill the desire of the people, the real people who want to circulate? then essentially the circulation algorithm is neither ethical or neither unethical because it's neutral. It's basically just reflecting what people want to do as people could be ethical or unethical. Then the, the social algorithm is, is actually uh, neutral. But if we actually think about what should we read, um, then that question might be even deeper. If that's the design of the, of the uh, purpose and, and here I don't mean we have a big brother to mandate what should we read. I'm actually talking about um, what what have we missed. That's that's actually the. If you're interested to know certain topic, you should know what you have missed or what you have been misinfluenced in, in that in that uh, process. Okay. Okay, so I, I have no more questions. Sorry, I asked a lot of questions right. than normally I would. Um, but uh, do you have any comment or any response to what I just said the last maybe 10 minutes? Uh, I think it's a really, really interesting question. And I, I felt like what, one point you made in the beginning I thought was really sad, which is that we can't just be focused on like trying to stem the bleeding anymore. We need to start actually treating the issue. Because there's wounds, and we need to treat these wounds if we want it to heal, because our society is divided. And so it's not just about stopping fake news, it's about spreading good news so that people can start to understand one another a bit more. And I thought that was a really, really interesting point. And I agree with it in the abstract, but I think, like you said, Professor, it's 
a question that's kind of hard to, to think about, like how do we implement this? Because like, oh, as you said, we want to avoid an Orwellian situation where we tell people, no, this is what you should read. It's also a question, for example, when, so Twitter, uh, back in the time of 2020, and there's a lot of election misinformation going around. On all of their posts, they put up uh, like links to like to official resources on the election. Or for example, Facebook, when the COVID pandemic was going on, you'd see a post at the top of your screen every time you use it saying, hey, uh, here's a recent who, who guidelines on COVID, et cetera. They were trying in their own way to put forward exactly what you're saying, just give people good information instead of just dealing with the bad ones. But that wasn't, at least, I don't have their data, so I don't know how effective it was. But it seems that it engendered a lot of frustration among people because they felt that they were being told what was right or wrong. And for some people, it seemed to radicalize them further where they would, and so I think it's a difficult question because it's necessary, but it's also about doing it in a way that's subtle enough that it doesn't upset people who are already on one side of this issue, if that makes sense. Right. I mean, the, we always, when we engineering a, a system, we always have to consider the psychology, the behavioral perspective of, of the people, how they will respond to any engineering solution. Um, and, and, and that is another challenging issue. How do we really exercise that? Um, I, I do think that there is a, there is a fundamental um, difference between these two questions on the screen, uh, because this will, this will guide the high level design about, about um, the, the, the circulation that we would like to have. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, um, you, I Professor. think, yeah, this is a great uh, uh, piece of work. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, I thought we can get it done in 30 minutes. We use a 50 minutes. Okay. That, that's good. All right. So I, I wish uh, you all have a good summer and uh, uh, I'm going to stop recording and uh, oh yeah. Uh, Amen, you want to say something? Yes. Um, it's actually on behalf of someone else. There's someone in our class named Alia Abbas and she reached out to me because she mentioned that uh, like there's hold, a on, hold on, group. hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm actually, let me stop recording before you, okay. you mention somebody's case, okay?